Fish, a major source of protein for billions of people around the world. But our oceans are running dry. 50% of the global fish stock has been depleted. Ya bisa ratusan meter pas sekarang mah untuk mencari ikan yang agak banyak kan gitu supaya penghasilan ya lumayan gitu kalau untuk ikan 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 ikannya yang ditangkap tuh bisa agak susah agak ke tengah. Climate crisis hoyeche, eh je jolobayu shongkor dekha diyeche. Si jolobayu shongkor te jono kara day. Are we at risk of running out of fish? And what solutions do we have? This is Muara Anka. It is one of the four fishing communities located in the northern part of Indonesia's capital, Jakarta. Around 200 families live in this area, with the smell of fish thick in the air. Many are poor migrants from central Java, who came to Jakarta in the hope of a better life. Among them is 42-year-old Royadi. Kari semenjak tahun 97 saya udah terjun ke laut artinya jadi nelayan dari semenjak ya us dari semenjak ayah saya meninggal aja udah langsung terjun nelayan gitu dari usia 13 tahun kalau nggak salah Every day after 7 in the evening Riyadi drives his boat out to the Bay of Jakarta, where he spends at least six hours fishing. He sells whatever he can catch at the nearby market. Dari kerapu, kue, tengiri, banyak lah. Pokoknya dari kembung, dari kalangan menengah sampai atas, dari bawah sampai atas ada. Fish and seafood are one of our most important sources of nutrients. Over three billion people get at least 20% of their daily animal protein intake from fish. But globally, our fish supplies are dwindling. Following the uh, reference from the Global Fishing Index, uh, it has shown that 50% uh, of the global fish stock has been depleted, you know, based on uh, pre-well-captured uh, fishery days. Uh, we believe that this information uh, is understated and is far more worse than what it is uh, today. I think it's increasing demand for fish, which is a good thing because fish are very important for nutrition. Yeah, so increasing demand, but then I think we are fishing more than what we can, what fish can reproduce. So it is demand outstripping supply. We all love fish, but then we might not have fish to eat soon if, if again this trend continues. At the Muara Anka Market in Jakarta there is less fish coming from sea to store. Dalam satu bulan pasti ada surutnya. Di antara satu minggu, dua minggu pasti ada. Pasokan terutama kebanyakan dari Laut Jawa. Kalau Teluk Jakarta sebenarnya bisa dikatakan sedikit. Karena ya faktornya polusi. Jadi Laut Jakarta sebenarnya ikan tuh nggak ada. Sedikit lah. Indonesia is the world's second largest fish producer after China. Per capita, the average Indonesian consumes about 40 kilograms of seafood a year, twice the global mean. But Indonesia fish stocks are under threat. A report last year by Indonesia's fishery ministry showed that fish stocks in the country have declined by 4% over the past five years. Nearly half of the archipelago's wild fisheries, like the Bay of Jakarta, are quickly depleting due to a few reasons. One is that illegal fishing and overfishing, right? Uh, illegal fishing, you know, because Indonesia is very porous, uh, so it's, uh, I think, I guess it's easier for like foreign vessels to, uh, to intrude to the Indonesian water. And uh, in terms of over, in terms of overfishing, because most of uh, 
Indonesian vessels are very small, it's very difficult to monitor. And of course, the second thing is uh, temperature rise at sea, right? That created damage to coral reef, which is the uh, part of the ecosystem of fish. Coral reef could also be damaged by by unsustainable uh, fishing practices, like using bombs and these kind of things. And then the third thing, uh, the, the third challenge uh, is, uh, is on, on pollution. For Jakarta Bay, pollution from urban development has damaged the coastal environment. Reclamation projects in the 1990s created upscale housing complexes and shopping malls. Coastal developments also alter near-shore habitats and can affect fish populations as these habitats are often densely inhabited by juvenile fish. Ya, ini nih dampak bangunan-bangunan seperti ini nih. Biasa kita mancing di pinggir-pinggir juga enak-enakan gitu maksudnya di pinggir. Ya paling jarak-jarak 20 meter, 10 meter sampai 20 meter dari tepian juga. Dulu mah enak gitu maksudnya ikan tuh masih rame lah. Nah, semenjak ada bangunan-bangunan ini terus adanya banyak-banyak limbah juga keluar dari pabrik mua antar muara-muara itu jadi kendala juga bagi kita nelayan-nelayan kecil gitu pak. Ya bisa ratusan meter pas sekarang mah untuk mencari ikan yang agak banyak kan gitu supaya penghasilan ya lumayan gitu kalau untuk ikan ya ikan-ikannya yang ditangkap tuh agak susah agak ke tengah. But not all fishermen can go further ashore. The reason? Rising fuel prices. Globally, fuel prices have surged, a result of the war in Ukraine and post-pandemic demand. In Indonesia, fuel prices increased by 30% after the government reduced fuel subsidies last year. Benar-benarlah kalau solar naik tuh. Namanya kadang-kadang ya kita melautnya kan istilahnya ya begitulah istilahnya nyari-nyari kadang-kadang belum tentu yang dicari kadang-kadang untuk dampaknya solar ini naik untuk mengurangi gitu daripada kita keluar tetap gak dapat hasil gitu sedangkan perbekalan banyak ya itu bisa jadi juga sih pas sebenarnya kok nelayan itu bisa bisa nggak melautnya gitu karena Elsewhere in India, pollution has also had a disastrous effect on fishing communities. In the middle of 2022, scientists discovered an area that is almost devoid of life in the Bay of Bengal, a dead zone almost the size of Bangladesh. Now, dead zones are usually formed, you know, when there is uh, impediment in the movement of water. Okay, let me give you an uh, example. Uh, I was in Lake Vota uh, just before the pandemic and uh, there was, you know, there are fishing cage uh, culture in, in, in that huge lake. Uh, but it was strange that we found that one area of the lake, uh, they had massive mortality and uh, we could not tell what was the reason. But when we put in our probe into the water, we found that the area had almost zero uh, percentage of dissolved oxygen. And this is what they kill uh, the fish. One cause of oxygen depletion is algae blooms, which occur when there is a sudden proliferation of algae. This can block sunlight to underwater plants, consume nutrients and deplete oxygen, creating a dead zone. For the Bay of Bengal, it has been suggested that fertilizer and industrial runoff that are washed into the sea encourage the growth of algae. Because of the dead zone, the fish stocks in the bay are now severely depleted, affecting the 400 million people living in the area around the bay. People like fisherwoman Tapashi Dolai. Tarpori amar biye hoy gale ekhane shamir bari. Shami o mas shonge jukto mas. Shami ro biye rage illegal chilo prochur mas beto dokon. Dokon mas mane halnar binge mane be eto mas hoto 30 kilo, 40 kilo, 50 kilo, 60 kilo kore mas hoto. Kintu tar tulone to ekhon ekdom mas. I hadno kai gile hadno kar khetche bolchi. Mas hole karor hoche 5 kilo, karor hoche 10 kilo, karor hoche kono din hoche 3 kilo, kono din 2 kilo, kono din mote holo na. As fishing grounds deplete from human activity and overfishing, competition for what remains becomes more intense. 
For small fisher folk like Muriadi and Tapashi, this means running up against the big players. Choa Thuan Bien village lies on the coastal province of Quang Nai in central Vietnam. Bien means sea in Vietnamese and the people have lived off the ocean for centuries. Among them are 54-year-old Dang Tam and 50-year-old Dang Tu, fishermen and brothers. Quang Bá Hào hết, thì tính ra nếu mà làm mà biển là năm 17 tuổi mới già, mà sắm ngày ra đi làm là năm nay nữa được trên 15 năm rồi. Sắm ngày đi đánh bắt cùng xóa, làm chung Bá Hào nữa thì tính ra hai mươi mấy năm rồi. Đánh bắt có thì nói chung cái hầu nó cũng gặp cây thì nó cũng có, không có mà gặp cây nó cũng khó lắm. Không có nông vua mà đó làm nó cũng khó. Biển bây giờ thì nói chung bắt vào có nhiều, không có nó cũng hiếm rồi. Vietnam is the world's third largest fish exporter, after China and Norway. It exported over 11 billion US dollars worth of seafood last year, a growth of more than 20% year on year. This boom has led to questions of sustainability. Một cái bức tranh của một huyện ở ven biển của của Quảng Ngãi, nó cũng phần nào đó thể hiện cái bức tranh chung của cái vùng ven biển Việt Nam. Chúng ta đã nhiều năm khuyến khích cái việc tiến ra đánh bắt ở trên biển. Đội tàu càng ngày càng lớn hơn, cái trữ lượng cá trong vùng biển đặc quyền kinh tế Việt Nam đã giảm đi rất đáng kể. Mà việc giảm trữ lượng đi cùng với việc tăng công suất đội tàu thì dẫn đến cái nghịch lý là càng đầu tư vào đánh bắt With coastal areas fished out, fishermen like Dang Tam and Dang Tu have ventured further out into distant waters. This can be risky. In 2012, the brothers ran into some trouble when they encountered a Chinese government vessel in the disputed waters of the South China Sea near the Parcel Islands. Trong nhà bác nhiều lắm, nhà bác nhiều lắm. Bác lái đồ lái đồ Đói nhiều xa. lắm, cái phiên đó là hết khe bù kêu nào về sắm đồ sắm đồ lại là hết khe trăm mái á, triệu to lắm. Hai trăm mái triệu làm ngày mong nại rồi về cái rồi em cũng còn mong nại biết mà em gia tiền vào nước nên mong nại biết mà. Since 1999, China unilaterally prohibits fishing every summer in the South China Sea, north of 12 degrees north latitude. China claims most of the South China Sea through what it says is a historical map showing a nine-dash line, a claim disputed by several neighboring countries, including Vietnam. Ostensibly, China says the ban is for sustainability of fish stocks, and so Chinese Coast Guard patrolled the area from May to August, arresting local and foreign fishermen alike. To further assert its claims, China has reclaimed land and built military installations in the South China Sea. It was at one of these installations that Dang Tu and his brother was detained by a Chinese government vessel. Anh đó nhóc mừng ngày, mừng ngày chứ, mừng ngày mà anh khổ lắm, anh cực anh khổ lắm mà hầu cái thay đó là nói chung là không có bù hiểm, rồi trả trả mừng ngày đó nó cũng cho anh cực khổ lắm, anh chỗ rồi yên chỗ, đớn chỗ luôn, tám chỗ luôn cũng như tàu vậy mà nói chung cũng ấy như tàu vậy mà bữa sau đó nó trâu về trâu về chứ mà đồ nó vẫn lại hết nó không còn cái gì chứ nói chung là không còn cái gì chứ lại hết luôn á ngư vợ của ngư dân mà có chồng mà đi đánh bắt trên biển rất là lo lo cái thứ nhất ấy là vấn đề sức khỏe cái thứ hai ấy là đi lò mới là lò mã ngoài quần xoa thì biết rồi là Trung Quốc luôn rầm rịch là rình màu cứ là bác lấy đồ rồi đuổi này nọ mình lo đủ thứ lo hết chứ rồi bổ giáo rồi rồi lo còn có cái nỗi là lo đi làm về rồi bón gió cỏ nữa biển mình vừa đi làm kinh tế cho mình vừa bám biển nhưng mà thật ra đi làm ngang mày khổ lắm khổ lắm 
đó thì như đi lộn roi mà cái thứ nhất thì sức khỏe cái thứ hai thì đi roi đi lộn giống như là đi đi đi, đi ăn trộm vậy cứ kêu vùng biển quần xoa là của việt nam à, mà đi roi là trung quốc nó giấy miết giấy miết đi nợ cái mà đi roi ngang họ đuổi miết đó nghe không là hết giàu nợ cái giàu trả đó là hết giàu mà hết giàu trả nghe là về tổng tổng biết bao nhiêu là tổng At the heart of the conflict is severe depletion of fish stocks, though the South China Sea accounts for only 2.5% of the planet's ocean surface area, it produces 12% of the world's fish catch. But since 2000, catch rates have declined by 70% and as much as 90% for larger fish species. And competition is intensifying for the shrinking fish pie. Many a times there are quarrels among nations is, you know, with regards to what we call boundary lines, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's not dotted at all in, in the sea. And uh, you have issues where, you know, fishermen has been claimed that, you know, their fishing ground has been encroached by uh, foreign vessels. And by the time the marine police arrive, you know, the foreign vessels are no longer there. It's had a quota, but it will be very difficult to, to implement and even to check on the quota, uh, whether it is implemented Okay, now based on the recent report by WWF, if we continue to fish at the current rate, we forecast that by 2048, we will run out of fish. Vietnam has an offshore fishing fleet of about 30,000, made up of mostly small boats. While it is estimated that China has between 200,000 to 800,000 boats, it also has the world's largest deep water fishing fleet, numbering almost 3,000. Both the Vietnamese and Chinese are known to use trawl fishing, which scoop up large amounts of fish by dragging nets along the sea floor. It's been called the worst fishing technique in the world. Trong những năm vừa rồi, phải nói là ngư dân của chúng ta trong nhiều vùng đã áp dụng những công nghệ mà tận diệt cái hải sản. Anh tưởng tượng là khi kéo mẹ lưới lên mà toàn là cá con, vì mắt lưới rất dài. Thì nếu đánh hết cá con thì làm gì còn cá lớn? Vì người ta đánh hết cá lớn rồi. Đến lúc mà cá con nó chưa kịp lớn thì đã bị đánh. Fishery resources are essential to the 190 million people residing in the coastal areas of the South China Sea. Over 77% of whom depend on fishery resources for their daily protein intake or family income. With fish stocks dwindling and prices rising, Ironically, fishermen like Dang Tu are unable to afford the fish he catches. Hôm nay mình đi chợ có nó rẻ thì mình ăn có, mà có nó đắt quá thì mình chuyển qua mình mua cái thứ khác gì mình ăn. Chứ bây giờ mình thích ăn có nhưng bây giờ có đắt quá thôi bây giờ mình nhịn đi, mình nhịn bữa hơn bữa mình ăn cái thứ rẻ hơn. The issue of a shrinking fish population mirrors the plight of many coastal fishermen around the world. In India, Tapashi Doloi has lived in Tiangra Cha village for half a century. Here at the mouth of the Hooghly, a distributary of the Ganges, where it meets the sea. আমি আমার বাবার সঙ্গে ছোটবেলা থেকে 10 12 বছর বয়স থেকে ছোটবেলা থেকে বাবার সাথে নদীতে মাছ ধরতে যেতাম আমার ভাই ছিল নদীতে মাছ ধরতে যেতাম আমরা সাত ভাই বোনে বাবা একা খেটে তো সংসার চলবে না তাই জন্য আমি সবার বড় ছিলাম বাবার সঙ্গে মাছ ধরতে যেতাম তারপরে যখন একটু আরো বড় হলাম একা একাও মাছ ধরতাম But now the tide has turned for Doloy and her family what she could catch in a day years ago is no longer possible. Like the Dang brothers in Vietnam, here too, subsistence fisher people are outmuscled by large trawlers. Fighting for the rights of people like Tapashi is Pradeep Chatterjee. 
His group has been working with coastal fishermen for years, conveying their concerns over destructive fishing practices by big trawlers to the government. A fisherman turned advocate, he has witnessed the coastal areas of India change from a region of abundance to an area of scarcity. অবস্থা সত্যি খুব খারাপ আমরা যদি এই ভারতবর্ষের দিকে তাকাই আমাদের দেশের দিকে তাকাই তাহলে দেখব যে নিয়ার শোর এরিয়া অর্থাৎ উপকূল সমীপবর্তী যে এলাকাগুলো আছে সেখানে মাছ প্রায় নেই বললেই চলে এটা কেন নেই প্রথমত এবং প্রধানত এটা এই কারণে নেই যে এটা ওভারফিস্ট হয়ে গেছে এলাকাগুলো এবং ডেস্ট্রাকটিভ ফিশিংও হচ্ছে শুধু ওভারফিশিং নয় ডেস্ট্রাকটিভ ফিশিংও হচ্ছে যেটা রিজেনারেশন অফ ফিস স্টককে আরও আরও কম করে দিচ্ছে আরও ক্ষতিগ্রস্ত করে দিচ্ছে স্টকটা ন্যাচারাল যে ফিস স্টক আছে প্রাকৃতিক যে মৎস্য সম্পদ আছে সেটা তখন আরও কমতে আরম্ভ করবে তো এই জিনিসটাই আমাদের সারা ভারতবর্ষের উপকূলে হয়েছে এবং পৃথিবীর ব্যাপক জায়গাতে এই জিনিসটাই দেখা যাচ্ছে And even as fish is taken out of the oceans in large quantities, climate change is affecting their replenishment rates. The ocean is warming year by year now. Why is this affecting fish stock? Fish has a, what we call a thermal tolerance. It can only tolerate up to two degrees uh, thermal tolerance uh, difference. Anything more than that, the fish go into a stress mode. It will start diving deeper or you move towards the North Pole or the South Pole. In a worst case projection, a five degree change in ocean temperatures could wipe out 60% of all fish by the year 2100. Grim news for the millions who make their living by the sea. Coastal community will be more at risk because the, uh, the cycle of the prey and predatory within the uh, wild uh, fishery, it's, it's all been affected. These are the small farmers, these are the low-income uh, farmers, and yes, these farmers will be affected. So, I can see, I mean, four or five or one, we can see or eat or buy. This is how it is. So, I can chat to them. I mean, this is fishery. The whole thing is, I mean, the fish, the fish, the fish. But Baghdad chingri, I mean, how the how the color, how the color, how the color, how the color, Baghdad is that big. I can see that they are not. With wild fish stocks depleted at unsustainable rates, can farmed fish fill the supply gap? In the quiet commune of Tin Ki in central Vietnam, Vo Tung and his wife, Nguyen Thi Mi Dung, tend to their fish farm. On this 5,000 square meter farm, Vo Tung rears a variety of fish, such as rabbit fish, giant kingfish, and pompano. He started this farm last year, making the switch from offshore fishing. <laughs> Bây giờ là cứ như ở đây tôi được biết tôi cũng đi đi biển hồi trước khi đi biển nhưng bây giờ tôi nghĩ rồi số là ở đây là cái vùng biển trên như ở Nghĩa An ở kia là người ta bây giờ là người ta đi đi giả bây giờ xa bờ là hình như là con cá nó ở ngoài khơi nó đã ít trời rồi bây giờ là thấy cái nhu cầu hiện tại là dân thì còn đông mà ngày là cá nó còn là ít lần thành ra đi ở đây thì bây giờ là người ta đi đi làm cung nghiệp ấy tiếp cận là thăm đi with fish stocks in the ocean decreasing, many, like Vo Tung, decided to eke out a living on land instead. With the help of a government grant of $10,000, he now raises fish in six submerged cases. With the wild catch declining at alarming rates, Fish farming, or aquaculture, is increasingly important. It now makes up almost half of the world's fish supply, with Asia being the main aquaculture producer for the last two decades, producing 92% of the total world aquaculture products. Và Trung Hoa đã đã nuôi cá từ hàng ngàn năm nay và các nước của các quốc gia châu Á cũng đi theo con đường đấy và có cái cội nguồn lịch sử rất là lâu đời 
Tuy nhiên là cái điều kiện mà thuận lợi nhất cho châu Á, đặc biệt là Đông Nam Á đó là cái vùng khí hậu nhiệt đới. Khí hậu nhiệt đới ẩm gió mùa đã khiến cho các loài cá, các loài thủy sản trong đó có cá là phát triển rất là phong phú, rất đa dạng, rất nhiều chủng loại và rất nhiều loài có giá trị kinh tế cao. In India, aquaculture is projected to grow by more than 50% in the next five years. The Indian government calls it a blue revolution, as inland fisheries and aquaculture output reach 12 million tons between 2021 and 2022. It is 100% uh, true because uh, total uh, fish production, aquaculture production uh, is going up and uh, lots of quality fishes we are producing. Uh, aquaculture production is booming, like your Andhra Pradesh, uh, even Haryana, Punjab, they are producing lots of prawns, and uh, their fish production is uh, uh, booming there. It's the middle of the night in cold, misty Kolkata. But for Gopal Bose, it's time to go to work, something he has done since he was 15. Gopal's workplace is a large fish farm on the eastern fringes of the Indian city. It is run as a cooperator by the fishermen and they share in each day's takings. Every night, come what may, Gopal and his colleagues have to reach their workplace on time. Fish farming can be done in natural waterways like rivers, lakes and oceans or in purpose-built tanks. Extensive fish farming uses the natural conditions of the waterway to grow the fish while intensive farming requires intervention like fish feed and water filtration. This can be capital intensive, something Gopal and his partners can scarce afford. As a result, the production of the 800-acre fish farm is falling. We have regular fish farm. We have well, aquaculture will become increasingly critical to the world's fish supply, it is facing its own set of challenges from land shortages, pollution, cost of capital, and farmer knowledge. They are not uh, managing the, their uh, farm properly. And uh, another aspect is that uh, for the proper fish production, we need good quality of feed. In our country, there is a deficiency also in the good quality of feed also. Uh, so far, we are bringing the feed from outside. If you uh, bring the fish from outside, it, it will be expensive. Another thing is that it is a global pro problem. I mean, see, more than 60% of the uh, fish production cost is due to the feed. Back in Vietnam, Votong is facing issues of his own. Even fish farms cannot escape the impact of climate change. Khoảng tầm tháng 10 tháng 11 thôi, chứ tháng chợp là nắng ấm rồi. Mà năm nay là tháng chợp mà tháng 12 mà nó vẫn lạnh. Mấy năm tháng tư tháng 12 là nó nắng ấm rồi chứ nó không có lạnh nhiều nên nó là lạnh mưa nhiều. Thời tiết này là nằm khoảng tháng 11 thôi nhưng mà lên lên tháng 12 nó vẫn còn. Ví dụ như tháng này là mình mình nuôi là mình son có nó lồng nó bình an mình thấy là mình ổn định mình cho ăn nhưng mà thời tiết như vậy là nước còn xấu cho nên là cũng chưa có ổn định được, chưa có dám thả cá con xuống. 
sợ là sợ là nó, nó nước ngọt xuống đó nó không tốt nó chết nó, nó, nó không có đọt Changes in temperature greatly affect the fish's life cycle. Temperatures that are too low can stun the growth of fish, while waters that are too warm impair reproduction as it affects the hormone production of fish. Warmer waters also have less oxygen, which is a further stressor on fish populations. Thường thì trong những năm gần đây khi mà trái đất ấm lên ấy, thì các cái cơn bão nó có xu hướng mạnh lên không những mạnh về cường độ mà nó cái tần suất bão nó tăng lên à, như trong năm nay anh thấy là rõ ràng là chúng ta có rất ít tương đối ít các cơn bão nhưng điều đó không nghĩa là số cơn bão được bị giảm đi mà cái tần suất uh, trong các năm tiếp theo cụ thể là năm 23 này sẽ là cái rất là đáng lo ngại thì bão là một chuyện nhưng những biến đổi về hệ sinh thái trong lòng biển mới là cái đáng lo ngại nhất mà tôi cho rằng là cái điều mà chúng ta cần làm trước hết ấy, là cần tăng cường đầu tư và nghiên cứu khoa học về tác động của biến đổi khí hậu đến hệ sinh thái của biển đến những chủng loài có thể gây bệnh cho người và cho thủy sản đặc biệt là cho các loài cá mà chúng ta đang nuôi The ocean is getting warmer. We all know about uh, ocean acidification, uh, ocean warming. We have a lot of problem now, especially with those who are breeding uh, in open cages uh, of salmon in, uh, in Chile, in Norway. They have been faced, hit by uh, massive algae bloom, uh, threats of parasites like the sea lice. And this is all because of the warming uh, ocean. I see floating cage uh, as a sunset industry. With even fish farms suffering the effects of climate change, can technology provide the answers to these problems? Overfishing and climate change are threatening the world's supply of fish. With warming river and ocean waters affecting the viability of wild catch and fish farms, there is growing food insecurity. The solutions could lie in innovations. In Singapore, a city-state known more for its financial services than farming, one company is working to weatherproof their farms. These are our uh, basically hatchery tanks. So what we do here, after they, they brew their stocks, they lay egg. So we collect the egg, we transfer them here. Tucked away in the northwestern part of the island is Blue Aqua, a land-based shrimp farm. The farm uses technology to monitor the life cycle of the crustaceans. By carefully controlling the environment, everything from the temperature of the tank to the salinity of the water. It ensures that the shrimp grow up healthy and large. This is a monodon, so we have three species here. But those animals grow larger, it will be something like this. So this is the last stage. So this animal uh, we are transferring to the grow out uh, by tomorrow, most probably. A grow out tank is a much larger space that allows the shrimp to grow to harvest size. But even with such precise controls, it is still hard to completely mitigate weather factors. In the last one week, you can notice that we do have a lot of rain. So usually rain uh, causes lower temperature, so it drops the temperature. Even though we have a heater sometimes put inside this, but the temperature outside at night can drop a lot. And that causes us a you know, slow growth. If this low temperature continues longer, we may even lose animals. So, for us, the best way is to add a heater try, because we have to maintain the temperature inside this tank, the water temperature, at somewhere around 27, 28, 29, 30, around that range. Another challenge is making sure that the shrimp remain disease-free. This is the lab uh, for our shrimp farm. It's part of like, like a biosecurity measure. Yeah. Because like in shrimp, uh, they don't have like a 
adaptive immune response, uh, unlike like human or like fish. While fish or humans can adapt to various diseases, shrimp rely only on general immunity. It is a generic immune system and is unable to develop a targeted immune response against various pathogens. This means that shrimp are highly vulnerable when infected. This uh, lab we can do like uh, bacterial culture, uh, PCR testing, water quality testing. So this lab is actually like a PCR lab. So there is like PCR machine and all the equipment that is inside here are uh, capable of doing PCR. So uh, we can test about like seven types of shrimp diseases. With an on-site lab and staff to operate it, the costs of land-based farming are much higher than traditional farming methods. But Blue Aqua can produce more than double the output of a traditional shrimp farm, which averages one to two kilograms per square meter. Our stocking density is one of the highest in the world. So we have a, a very high biomass production. So we produce for Wanami maybe about eight to 10 kilograms per square meter. And for Monodon, uh, we can hit somewhere about maybe three to four kilograms, which is the, you know, one of the highest in the whole industry. Blue Aqua now plans to expand their facility and use their know-how to farm other species. We do have a plan, which started already this year, to do the production of the rainbow trout in Singapore. Uh, a lot of people say, why rainbow trout and why Singapore? I think rainbow trout, because we use fresh water, so, and our land do not have access to the seawater. The second thing, uh, rainbow trout is a fish that we do have very, very high uh, technology involved already so many years. So our final goal of production is 3,000 metric tons of the rainbow trout per year in Singapore. But land-based farming alone isn't enough to feed the world. Seafood consumption worldwide has more than doubled in the past 50 years. The global average consumption of fish and other seafood per person reached a record high of 20.5 kilograms in 2019. Working to develop alternative sources of protein are the people at the Protein Innovation Centre in Singapore. It's a facility jointly set up by Swiss companies Bula and Givaudan. This is a place where we help to develop plant-based fish or meat analogs. Today, we are going to show you how to create a tuna mimic. Here we are located where we will start the whole process. We have the proteins. In this case, we are going to use soy protein as an ingredient. We have the proteins and the pre-blends in a dry powder form. We will start adding liquids, oils, and flavors to reach the tuna taste that we want to do. Inside the extruder, what we do is a mechanical and the thermal work on the proteins to realign the proteins. With this realignment, we will get the nice long and fibrous textures that we want to get on the different type of meats. Further down the extruder, the product is injected with nitrogen and then cooked before cooling. The result is a product with a flaky texture that resembles that of fish and some of the same nutritional value. We have the same amount of protein compared to a fish on a plant-based product. The only part that we are, as of now, missing is the omega-3 oils. For this, we are working already to do the next generation of fish products where we will add cultured fats into the plant-based product. With this, we can close the gap for the nutritional values. Working to close that gap is Impact Fat, a startup that is developing fish fat that is grown from fish cells. We use so-called cellular aquaculture technologies, and there are three main steps. First, small biopsies are taken from fish species that are edible, and cells are extracted. Then so-called cell lines are isolated after screening through thousands of single cells. Second, we grow the cells to trillions or more in cell number. And third, these cells are stimulated 
to become mature fat cells that contains you know, many nutrition like omega-3 fatty acids. Impact Fat hopes that cultured cell meat will be able to tackle some of the issues around waste and pollution. We think there are different ways to save the environment. The first, the, we can only produce the edible portions of the meat so that uh, you know, we, we don't have to kill the fishes. The second, we can make it clean so that uh, it doesn't have any pollutants such as microplastic, the pathogens, and mercury. And third, we can be more energy efficient, meaning that uh, we don't have to use as much water and feed as overfishing or traditional aquacultures. However, the fish fat product is still in testing and to get it to the manufacturing stage would still take another five to 10 years. The market for fish-friendly alternatives is expected to grow to 1.6 billion US dollars in the next decade at a compound annual growth rate of 28%. However, that would only represent just 1% of the total seafood market. So right now, is culture itself, to me, is old technology, nothing new about it is how to culture them in a very cost-effective way because technology, when you first start, is always much more expensive. And like everything else, the price of technology will drop as it progressed. We believe eventually it will be cheaper and cheaper because when more players coming into the scene, the scene, more ideas will be generated. While we continue to invest in technology, the world is racing against time to manage the way we fish. So overfishing among destructive fishing ke bondh korte hai. Taale prathame destructive fishing ke je gear gulo aache, jamon bottom trolling, jamon par sailing, eglo ke bondh korte hobe. Ek, among dui overfishing ta ke atka baad jono kota bethe diye hobe. Bolle diye hobe je mechanized fishing jara korchen, tarar aage pete hobe jara choto matsu jibi tadher mast aage tarar dhorbe. Tar pori je ta pori thakbe shi ta tarar dhorte pare. Tana hole pori kintu ekhan theke mukti nahi. Efforts to reform the fishing industry has been a mixed bag. Quota systems have seen some success in the US using a catch-share method. Instead of profiting from what they individually catch, fishermen get a percentage share of the fishery's total haul, which is capped at a sustainable number. This has led to the recovery of 70% of overfished species. But globally, reforms are more elusive. It took the WTO 20 years of negotiation to finalize a treaty to ban harmful fishing subsidies. These subsidies, which include fuel and boat construction offsets, are partly responsible for the existence of large, long-distance fishing fleets that overexploit fishing grounds. I think if you come from simplistic points of view, uh, remove subsidies easy, right? You just put a plug. What, what's so difficult about this? So a lot of things is the politics, right? It's what those situations that if you put a plug and then what are those people is going to eat, right? The livelihoods will be affected. I will not put these subsidies because they affect my vote. I will make sure these people are happy, right? So these are all the political things come into the place. So far, Two countries have ratified the WTO Harmful Subsidy Agreement. And unless urgent action is taken soon, we may find ourselves running out of fish and fishermen. Biarpun saya nelayan, kalau saya mampu, kalau saya bisa, bapaknya mah janganlah anak saya itu. Moga-moga ya jadi anak yang lebih sukses lagi lah, jangan kayak bapaknya begini gitu. Kalau bisa, saya mampu, selagi saya mampu gitu. Oh, the problem is that क्लैमेट क्राइसिस जलवायु संकट देखा दिए जलवायु संकटर जो कारा दायी 
যারা বেশি করে বেশি বেশি করে জীবাশ্ম জ্বালানি তৈরি করেছে বা জীবাশ্ম জ্বালানি ব্যবসা করেছে বা জীবাশ্ম জ্বালানি ব্যবহার করেছে তারা তো এর জন্য মাল্টিন্যাশনাল কোম্পানিগুলো যেগুলো জীবাশ্ম জ্বালানির ব্যবসা করেছে যারা যে সমস্ত বড় বড় প্ল্যান্টগুলো বিশেষ করে থার্মাল পাওয়ার প্ল্যান্ট ইত্যাদি ইত্যাদি এগুলো কয়লা তেল যেভাবে পুড়িয়েছে বা পড়াচ্ছে এরা হচ্ছে মূলত দায়ী এবং এর জন্য কিন্তু সাফার করছে কারা তারা সবথেকে বেশি কষ্ট পাচ্ছে এই উপকূলের সময়পবর্তী যে লোকগুলো মৎস্যজীবী সহ